That was easy. Um, <laughs> Joan Morris, South Clay Mop, from the song he's called upon me to quiet the crowd and to introduce her. So thank you. I didn't have to do much. <laughs> Please welcome Joan. Good evening. Um, Joan, thank you. That was a good reminder of uh, uh, what uh, privilege I have uh, being on of the Lacombe and the Songhees, not of the, of the Saanich people, to be here and to uh, raise a family here, to work here and more. So thank you. That was a good reminder that uh, we have this privilege, but not a lot of us. Um, uh, ever met, and so it's a good reminder of what we may do in our personal and professional lives to earn it. 
but thank you for that reminder. My name is Chris Garamont. I am the Science Director for Rain Coast Conservation Foundation. Um, I'm also the Hakai Rain Coast Professor of Geography here at UVic. Kind of like the opening act here tonight, the opening <laughs> band. Uh, very shortly, I'm going to pass it over to my friend and colleague, Doug Niesloss. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to pass you over to Alicia and Ilona of the Society of Geography Students. So please uh, warmly welcome these two women. <laughs> Rainforest wolf uh, that I first got to know 
in Helsinki territory, in what we now call, also call, the central coast of British Columbia. And part of that was just listening to people, older people, people like Chester Starr and Ed Martin, that told me things, knowledge that was embedded in stories, primarily, about uh, how people cannot really be disentangled from place or, or decoupled from the animals there. So if I were to learn about these animals, I should also learn about these people. And these people had grace and authority. They also had people sort of a generation or two behind them, these sort of warriors, gentle warriors, that, that kind of in a way enforced that the rules that the old timers laid down. And I had better listen to them. This is William Housty, he's about 6'6", six, six, a gentle giant, um, but uh, one of my, my uh, mentors and colleagues in Helsinki territory. So these lessons about people and the animals that I was there to study and, and some of the lessons I learned about how these animals are not just animals something other, these are the beings that are considered ancestors and relatives. Things like, this is grizzly bear tracks, this is a wolf that figured prominently at a summer camp that I've been volunteering at for, for many years. This is, of course, a deer, skull, and antler. This is an eagle, eagle down headdress. So I wanted to start with that sort of context uh, to tonight. Uh, we're going to talk, of course, about this wonderful place that especially people from city centers love to think about as a sort of pristine, untouched wilderness. The reality is, this, this wilderness has been um, lived in and lived off of for, for many thousands of years. Uh, we now know it as the central coast of, of British Columbia, but at, and at one time, and maybe not everyone knows this, but it once hosted the highest density human population uh, that didn't practice sort of modern day agriculture. But of course, they also practice both agriculture and aquaculture in this incredibly productive landscape. So we now notice the Great Bear, we should absolutely celebrate it also, for they are fantastic animals, these great bears, these grizzly bears. This is also an area that's so special that black bears come in white. That when we talk about wolves of the sea, there are two different alternative thing we might be speaking about. This is a place that, in which trails like this outnumber by an order of magnitude or length, say in kilometers, the amount of roads in the system. Now think about that. These are trails not made by someone in a hard hat and chainsaw and park signs everywhere. These are trails made by uh, no doubt people. Uh, and, and animals with which they share that landscape, in fact, whole ball in that landscape together. And at one time, of course, trails like this would have, if you were sort of fit enough and ambitious enough, you might be able to walk trails like this from the coastal temperate rainforest of southeast Alaska all the way down to northern Mexico along that sort of moister coastal fringe. But of course, you can't do that anymore. But you can still do it in much of, of the area we'll be speaking about tonight. Many of those trails were made for and kind of lead to this spawning salmon. And although uh, salmon have kind of taken a hit since uh, people who look like me showed up, um, it's still uh, a stronghold in, in North America for spawning salmon. I really want to acknowledge and, and thank Ray Coast for supporting me and my work and the way that we've chosen to go about our work uh, in this landscape, uh, doing our best to be uh, community-minded and community-engaged and doing sort of applied work 
where we can see uh, it getting outcomes that benefit both people there and the animals in the landscape that I might have been obsessed about and probably still am um, so many years ago. Brinkles really helped us figure out this sort of problem. This is what I call the standard model of conservation science by academics, people that are trained like me with PhDs, etc. So there's kind of three steps to this model. So the step one, you, you do research, ideally really rigorous research, target the highest ranking journals in the world, you publish your findings of conservation significance. Step two, so you kind of hope something's going to happen that, that in our case, maybe the province or the federal government will, will change the way things are for the better. You want to know what step three is? Yeah, you're returning to step one, because that's kind of all there is, really. So I really want to thank Ray Coast and, and colleagues like Doug and another level of government, an order of government, that in my view, a level of government with the uh, moral authority and increasingly the legal authority, even under sort of our legal systems, the colonial legal system, to manage local resources again. This is sort of a way that we can align our values and our knowledge as conservation biologists with the ways in which the world is increasingly working again towards a much better way of managing resources, a way that has been done for, for thousands of years. So it does give me hope. I want to tell you a little bit about Draco's for those of you who don't know. Uh, we're advocates, absolutely we are. We don't consider uh, that pejorative. Uh, if uh, those that disagree with us refer to us as advocates. We're informed advocates. We don't believe in, in shrill advocacy. We draw on science and that's available evidence in many cases that comes from our own work. Um, so step one is investigate so the science that we do here. Give you some examples. That didn't work very well here. Give you some examples on a global scale that has very much relevance to what we're talking about tonight. Here's some work we did with Tom Rankin, who's here tonight, a friend of Rain Coast, Caroline Fox, a Rain Coast postdoc, and Heather Bryan, a Rain Coaster, since her undergraduate days, now a Hakai postdoc. Uh, so reporting in, in the journal Science, we uh, evaluated, assessed the role of what we call human super predators, us and our, we reported on our disproportionate take of terrestrial mammals and especially marine fishes. So don't worry about the details of this graph. For those of you that like details, this is the probability of seeing an exploitation rate that high or higher. So the bottom line is fisheries, especially commercial industrialized fisheries, take way more than the shark share, way more than the marine mammal share way more adult fish prey than larger predatory fishes. We are the super predator in the ocean. On land, our take of herbivores is about the same as other carnivores, but where things really get messed up, where things get really get um, deviant and unique is our role as predators on other predators. That is our role as predators and hunters of carnivores. So here's some statistics from the paper. Human super predators, we kill adult carnivores at about four times the rate at which we kill herbivores. And for the mathematicians in the audience, you might figure out that's relatively easy to do because carnivores exist at such low population densities, it's actually really easy to draw down predator populations, and that's exactly what's happening. That's why we're losing so many of these carnivores from the face of the planet. That's why, in fact, we've lost grizzly bears from much of British Columbia. I'm going to show you a map very shortly on that. We kill carnivores like grizzly bears, like Cecil the lion and others, at about nine times the rate at which carnivores kill one another, because they do do that, but they do it at a very low rate. So I share this with you because we revealed and illustrated to as many people who would listen 
the reality is that these animals don't have the evolutionary history, the adaptations to deal with this sort of mortality, this sort of killing by a super predator like us. So this is sort of a global paper, a broad scale meta-analysis, but very much so is it relevant to tonight's conversation and the grizzly bear trophy hunt in BC. One quick matter of business uh, about grizzly bears. I've been seeing online that some people, um, I guess the, the correct word is accuse, or suggest that Rain Coast is somehow anti-hunting, that we're against uh, British Columbians, let's say, putting food on their table via hunting. We are not, absolutely not. We do distinguish the very big difference that about 90% of British Columbians share with us, and that is the difference between hunting for food and hunting inedible animals like grizzly bear for sport and trophy. Those two things are very different activities. Here's some science very relevant to tonight's conversation. This is work led by Rain Coast PhD student uh, Kyle Artell. As many of you have probably heard on the news or read, there's lots of controversy about how well the provincial government might or might not be managing this very controversial hunt. It's been speculated for two decades now that their management style is, shall we say, uh, dangerous and, and far from cautious. So what we did after securing the data, which took about five years, and a freedom of information request that went all the way to the Supreme Court of British Columbia to get the data from the province that we're keen on sharing the data with us as researchers, we found some troubling uh, realities. Uh, here we're seeing a map of British Columbia, and these are what are called grizzly bear population units, sort of roughly ecologically different um, subgroups of these animals. And here are color codes that we've assigned them based on their ability, the province's ability, to keep mortality, the number of bear deaths below their own very highest threshold. A threshold above which even their own numbers suggest that grizzly bears will start to decline. And so first I want to point out that we've lost grizzly bears from big chunks of the province in black. We are losing them or they are blinking out in gray and dark gray areas close to hunting because it's really hard to find bears there anymore or recently extirpated. We've lost another one right here, or right here recently. In green, the province, according to their own science, has done a, a decent job keeping mortality below those thresholds. In the yellow, they've blown it once over a three-year allocation period. In orange, they've blown it twice and not found, not discovered their errors over six different years. And in red, some of these pockets of the province they have repeatedly allowed mortality above their own threshold and not done anything about it. Now this is really troubling to us because the second part of this paper, we analyzed how they set those thresholds and whether or not they bothered to incorporate uh, what we call uncertainty as scientists. How many bears there are out there? How fast they can replenish their population when they're drawn down by these super predators, these trophy hunters? How much killing goes on that the government can't record, this unreported poaching, illegal kills, etc. So incorporating all that uncertainty, the map basically bleeds red, which is really, really troubling. So troubling, in fact, that we got published in the journal Science, a letter that essentially uh, illustrates that a government, and this is probably more widespread than we know or, or think to know, a government that commonly refers to the, the management of wildlife or fisheries as science-based likely is not if they can get away with a performance like this. Here's a kind of investigate that we really like. This is field research um, on the bears in the area, grizzly bears, black bears, spirit bears. This is our work. Uh, with our partners, who I'm going to introduce shortly, over 22,000 square kilometers, the size of El Salvador. At each spot here, you're seeing what uh, we call a non-invasive hair snagging station, where bears come and leave us a little present from which we learn a lot of information. 
So the coolest part about this project, other than the science, is that these questions are driven by our community partners, partners like Doug of the Kids in Hey Hey, uh, We Can Do Nation out of Rivers Inlet, uh, We Can Do Village New Hulk out of Bella Coola, the Help Sick out of uh, Bella Bella. This is what it looks like on the ground. This is, I don't know, maybe a eight, ten-year-old kind of mid-size, getting big, bare, kind of about the size of a smart car already, coming in, and he's gently going over a barbed wire fence. And in doing so, he's leaving a little bit of his fur. This is in the spring, so he's got all of last year's hair with him, and it's just falling out naturally. And he's coming to investigate this scent pile. This is a bait that we set for him. It's a non-reward bait. He can't eat it, so he doesn't stick around to defend it or really change his behavior. This guy puts on a show. The grizzlies, and, and for some reason the blacks don't, uh, the grizzlies like to rub in it. Uh, so he's gone on average in about two minutes, two minutes, five seconds on average. Uh, these animals uh, skedaddle and go about their, their lives. But what they've done is leave us a whole bunch of information. Using genetic tools, we can tell what species of bear this is or what species period, because we do get wolves and deer and wolverine, et cetera, through these stations. Um, we can tell which, what sex it is. Is it a male? Is it a female? We can even tell what individual bear it is. Have we caught this bear before or not? We can do a bunch of fancy lab work that tells us the uh, hormone profiles of this bear. If it was a female, was it uh, lactating recently? If it's a male and a female, actually, how high is its testosterone levels, a signal of the competitive environment? How high is the co uh, uh, cortisol levels, the measure of stress? All of which we can relate back to how much salmon that bear ate the previous year, which we are informed by by something called stable isotope analysis from those same pairs. So we know an awful lot about these bears without even necessarily seeing them. We're seeing them through remote camera here only. So the ecology is wonderful, but it's really how this project works socially and politically that's, that's really inspiring. So we have in, in New Hope territory, Heather working with Megan, uh, in Helsic, Kyle working with William, uh, in a week and Jennifer working with, with Megan, and as you hear about very shortly, uh, Christina working with Doug in Kittison Hay Hay Territory. This really is kind of a, the lifeblood, blood, the, the, the central organizational model to how we aspire and do, to the best of our ability, our work in a very community-engaged uh, process. Well, the Rain Coast is very lucky to have found partners in the Hakai Institute to create what we believe to be the first university laboratory of its kind that does work like this, that does work on the behalf of, of environmental organizations. So investigation is very important. Science alone is never going to change the world. Uh, so as a broader portfolio, we aim to inform decision makers. I'm not sure if you've seen this cartoon, you're only seeing half. Uh, so this is Enbridge sailing over the federal approval uh, process, of course. Even though we were a part of that, we were uh, so-called expert witnesses and formal interveners before the National Energy Board. Uh, they're about to smack into the judicial reviews that Rain Coast and others have launched. Uh, Doug's Nation also on a mountain of, of paperwork and expense in front of them. But really what's going to stop them, of course, is, is that. And that's going to work, but just in case, kind of behind uh, I want to do it. I'm so sure. Here's something a little more relevant to tonight, and, and this is kind of the, the marriage of some of the science and making it apply here. So, so Doug, uh, we've known Doug for, for actually a long time now, but Doug uh, came to us specifically on this bear file about three or four years ago, and asked us to help him and his people document um, what he was observing 
Um, so we threw up some remote cameras and some genetic work, and we also asked people in his village uh, and the neighboring Pelsex and Bella Bella about the distribution of grizzly bears. Formerly, they were on the mainland, as far as we know and as far as people know. Um, and of course, our modern day science tools can't tell us about the past. Only people could and their knowledge, their local knowledge. As Doug will explain shortly, this is the line at which the province separates where grizzly bears are, and in their mind, grizzly bears are not, according to the province. So that's what it looked like not too long ago, pre-92. In the decade after that, the percent of participants reporting uh, grizzly bears on the islands goes up somewhere around 50 to 30 to 50 percent. And these days, you can't go to an island without bumping into a grizzly bear. A really striking ecological change in this landscape. And as Doug will explain, the movement of grizzly bears to these islands is really important because if Doug has his way, and Doug will have his way, as you will find out, uh, those grizzly bears will bring real protection in terms of forest habitat to those islands. Doug will tell that story. You can investigate, you can inform decision makers, but it's also really important to engage with the public and we, you know, keeping with the literature uh, uh, situation here, triple eyes, we like to inspire at Rain Coast. One major way we do this is when we do our science, not stop at the publication stage, at, at, at publishing in peer reviewed journals. We like to engage the media so they help us tell the story. In doing so, we can help shape the narrative about what society thinks, feels, believes, etc. Because, uh, because community members, urban people, everyone likes and trusts science. So we find it, we feel it's our duty to help uh, uh, tell our stories, tell our science stories. And then we can kind of just sit back on issues like this and other people tell the story for us. And collectively, the work by people like Doug and, and other community members and, and that storytelling in science leads to data, sociological poll data like this that the province can't ignore for much longer. Doug will talk about that soon. And when informed advocacy isn't enough, what Ray Coast does, which is very inspiring to me, is kind of just uh, takes matters into their own hands. So these are guide outfitting territories. When someone from outside the province wants to come and kill a grizzly bear or a wolf or even a mountain goat, um, they have to come and hire some of these people uh, whose last names are here to guide them as professional guides. And they end up killing about 50% of the grizzly bears on the coast and probably many more of the wolves on the coast. And this had always troubled us, and as campaigners at Rain Coast, we fought against this for 10 or 15 years. But in 2003, as some may know, we took the matters into our own hands, raised uh, the money to do so, and bought out the first territory, the, which granted Rain Coast the exclusive rights to guide clients. And I can tell you that we still guide clients that are looking for bears. But we are really terrible guides in terms of uh, hunting. Some people even bring guns and we really ham it up. Uh, but they shoot bears with cameras. And they shoot those bears again and again and again with a camera. And in doing so, we crank down the killing level of grizzly bears by about half in a massive area, now about 30,000 square kilometers on the coast, about half of, of the so called Great Bear Range. So I think I'm done. I want to spend one minute or so introducing uh, my friend and, and colleague Doug. I mean, you can't get a business card big enough to fit all of Doug's jobs on it. Uh, I can tell you that he, uh, he carries uh, much weight of responsibility uh, around with him. Uh, he's a, a student of uh, his old people, of his old timers in this community, and uh, that is reflected in the way he governs as the chief counselor of his nation. Uh, I also really want to uh, 
uh, acknowledge and thank Doug for uh, giving Christina service, the same kind of um, uh, opportunities for sort of a rich uh, learning experience about how to be an applied scientist working uh, with a government like yours. So I want to thank and acknowledge you for that, Doug. And I'd like to ask every one of you to uh, warmly welcome Doug Beeslaw.